chapter 5 this morning. I might mention um, April 4th, our son Luke is getting married. And it, here at our church, if you would like an invitation to that wedding, please let me know. Okay? Luke is sending out invitations. Some have been sent out, but there may be some that um, would like to, to go. And, um, and we need to make sure that we get it all figured out because of the room in our church. And they're coming from Sailorville Church. Not, how many, not sure how many will be coming up from there. But keep that in mind. Another thing I might mention to you is on Sunday nights at 5 o'clock, we are doing, going to be doing doctrinal studies. Uh, it's basically Bible college in a church setting. Okay, You want to know what good Bible doctrine is? Join us Sunday nights at 5 o'clock. Um, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, Matthew 5, starting in verse 1, the Word of God says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, glad for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father, Help us as we study your word, teach us your word, and apply your word to our hearts and lives. Father, help us to develop a meek spirit. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, went against everything you've ever been taught. Everything that you grew up saying, this is what truth is, this is what right is, this is how I'm supposed to live. Jesus said, take it all, throw it away, because that's not the spirit of the kingdom. Today, we're going to talk about the strength of meekness. Jesus said, blessed are those who are meek, but they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, or they shall inherit the earth. You think about that and you realize that our world has misunderstood power. The old Greeks and Romans, the day that Jesus was preaching this, they believed that meekness was a character flaw. That if you were a meek person, there is something wrong with you. The movers and shakers in this world are those that assert themselves and put themselves forward. They're the ones that will have 20 selfies on their Facebook account to make sure you see who they are and where they're at. They're the ones that will push their way into a situation and try and take control. The world is operating today on the law of the jungle. The one with the biggest army is the one who makes all the rules. Only the strong survive, is what our world would say. Our world seems to operate on that thought that the only way to get ahead is to destroy other people, to assert yourself. In fact, when you look at the world in which we live, that's how business is lived, isn't it? There's a show on TV called The Shark Tank. A person who is really good in business, a person who's a really good investor is called a shark. I don't know if you know this, but sharks are the one fish that I really don't want to swim with. When we were in Grenada, I kept looking out on that ocean, making sure I didn't see that shark fin coming in. I don't want to be around sharks. And yet business operates in that same manner that they they see that the way to get ahead is to ruin someone else's business. You see this in society, that our world puts other people down trying to make themselves look 
better. And Jesus had that in the religious world as well. Look at Luke 11 with me. Luke 11, verse 46. Jesus said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourself do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. The blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. They thought the way to get ahead religiously is to destroy those who preach truth. Earlier, Jesus said, Woe to you, Pharisees, in verse 43, for you choose or you love the best seats in the synagogue. In that day and age, it would have been the front row seats, by the way. Now it's the back row seats. Um, you love the best seats in the synagogue, and you love the greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like graves that are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. You read on in Luke chapter 20. When Jesus is really laying it on the scribes and the Pharisees, in verse 45, Jesus said this, And then in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogue, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. In Jesus' day and age, religious people had no idea about what it meant to be meek. In Jesus' day and age, their deal was, hey, I want you to greet me as, as Father so-and-so. I want you to build me up. I want you to make me feel good. And I'm going to wear the long robe so that it looks like I'm really a classy dude. I've really got a lot going for me. The religious people saw themselves as a step above others. They saw themselves as a way to get ahead was to put down other people to the point that they would devour widows' households with their rules. Because after all, widows don't matter according to their worldview. They never saw their own sin. People who are not meek are people who are self-absorbed and proud. People who are pretentious, who think that the world revolves around them. And it happens today. Religious circles. Who's going to get ahead? Those who promote themselves. Those who build themselves up. Those who build lavish houses for themselves and fly around in unbelievable jets. You know, when I fly, I'm happy to fly coach, to be honest with you. I figured that they probably would rather me in the luggage section. You know, if I could afford to do it in the luggage section, you know, if I can get a way to do that, it'd be cheaper. But we live in a day and age that rather than doing the work of God is about self-promotion. And rather than confronting sin as sin, it is about making more people happy so I get a bigger budget and more money coming into me. And oftentimes the religious people look down on those who aren't quite where they ought to be. Because meekness even in our day and age, is almost seen as a character trait or a character flaw, something you want to run away from. The Bible tells us that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to stand apart from this self-seeking world. You see, this sermon is all about having a heart for God and a heart for the kingdom of God. You're not to be the same in the world. Righteousness always rejects that hamster wheel of self-promotion, that hamster wheel of pride. And look at me, everybody. Look at how great I am and how wonderful I am. God's called us to be different. Jesus says in verse 
five. Oh, how happy are those who are meek. Blessedness, the speaking of peace and satisfaction, of the joy of, of serving God. Meekness is being in the very center of God's will and not caring about who gets the credit for what you're doing. Meekness is someone who stands for God when the world rejects them and they continue to stand for God. Meekness is the absence of pride, the absence of pretension. You know, I think of meekness as being a measure, a, an honest measure of yourself, of who you are and what you're about. The ancient Greeks used the term meek to describe a well-trained horse, an animal that's extremely powerful but is under the guide and command of the owner. This last fall, my wife and I were able to see my uncle's horse named Blue. Big old Tennessee walking horse. Blue because he was a blue roan. He was a, um, uh, a beautiful horse, powerful horse. Had to be, he carried me on his back. He had to be strong. My uncle, who was in his 90s, was able to get Blue to kneel down Without a saddle, he jumps across his back, climbs on him, and rides him around the arena without a reins, without this, this road. That is a picture of meekness. This horse almost killed my uncle, by the way, um, when he first got him, and he got kicked. That's the problem with horses. You know, one end, well, there's two problems, with, three problems with horses. One end eats, the other end takes care of what it's eaten, and the third end kicks. Only three problems with horses. But that powerful horse was able to be under the control of a command and with knee pressure. Jesus is speaking about meekness here. Meekness does not mean you're powerless. It doesn't mean you're a limp-wristed, mealy-mouthed, milk-toast. But it does mean that you have control of yourself. And in fact, it means that you have a heart toward God where you see yourself honestly. A person who is meekness has a spiritual, or as meek, has a spiritual humility. They have a willingness to allow God to teach them. I see that as a big problem among Christians today. We don't want to learn from anybody. Our mind is already made up. They have a willingness for God to teach them. They cheerfully obey God's command even when it is difficult. Meek believers that have the heart of meekness will submit themselves to the will of God. Meek people patiently endure afflictions that God allows in their life. You see, most of us can't see ourselves as we are. This morning in Sunday school, we spent some time thinking about what we deserve. I always hear, it's not fair, I want what I deserve. Well, you know what you deserve? You deserve eternity in the lake of fire. So let's not go there. Meek people don't see that. Meek people need to see themselves as God sees them. You will never have a relationship with God until you see yourself as a sinner in need of grace. You will never be blessed by God until you realize that even though I'm born again, I still need God's grace and I need God to move in my life and I need to submit to God's will no matter what. Proud people do their own thing. Proud people say, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Meek people simply say, whatever God has called me, that's what I'll do. Our Savior is a picture of meekness. Let me just share some verses with you. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Jesus said in verse 28, Come, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle, same word as meek. It's the same word used for meekness. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest 
for your souls. First Peter chapter two, verse nine says this. I'm in the wrong second Peter two, verse nine. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And I've still got the wrong verse there. I do know Hebrews, I'll look it up later. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 talks about Jesus and his meekness. Um, and I think I know the verse I'm looking for now that I'm thinking through it. It says here in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus, in his meekness, was willing to submit to the hand of God. 1 Peter chapter 3 is the verse I didn't get. It says, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Jesus gives us a picture of what it means to be meek. Verse 18 of 1 Peter 3 says, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus willingly submitted to an ungodly, unjust government so that you could be saved. The only way that I can be meek is to have a changed heart. I'm going to let you in on a secret. The very core of my nature is not that of being meek. Did you realize that? My wife knows it. In fact, the very core of my nature is to put myself first, what my heart wants, I want to be the first one in the line. I want to be, have the front row seat at the baseball game. I want to be everybody to look at me and say, wow, what a great guy he is. That's not meekness. My very heart wants to put myself first in everything, and so does yours. Because that's not how we're wired. Our sin nature sees humility as a real problem. That being humble is something that we want to reject. We don't want anything to do with it. And meekness, why, that's for weak people. We all want to demand our rights. We all want to demand that we be treated fairly. We all want to shake our fist at other people and say, you better pay attention to me because I am important. That's our heart. You know how you're going to get that changed? By God changing your heart. By first of all placing your trust in the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. The Bible talks about our hearts being changed. Ezekiel speaks about changing the heart of stone to a heart of flesh. I can only have my very core, my very nature changed as I place my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And it's only when my heart is changed that I can understand what it means to be meek. Then after it's changed, I need to grow in the Lord Jesus. It's interesting that our world says the way to get ahead is to assert yourself and put yourself first. Jesus has a different idea. Look with me at Mark chapter 10. I, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible to preach on. Okay? I just love James and John. In verse 18, we have something, a situation happening. Um, by the way, they got their mom to do the same thing. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. You, get them, you picture them walking around, right? Hey, Lord, will you do me a favor? Would you give me what I ask for? And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? 
And then they said, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. Hey, I want to be number one and my brother number two in when the kingdom comes in. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, uh, baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And here's, here's the kicker. Here's what really gets me going. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Okay, get the picture, don't you? James and John says, I want to be number one and number two. And the other disciples are going, all of the gall, you know. Oh, man, how can they be that way? How can those go? What is wrong with those people? You know why they're mad, don't you? James and John asked first. That's why they're upset. You, you picture Peter saying, oh, no, I'm so humble and meek. I'd never ask for anything on myself. Old foot in the mouth, Peter? Of course not. But when you look at what Jesus says in the next few verses. But Jesus called them to himself. Okay, here they are. I'm not talking to him. Not to him. I'm mad. Jesus called them to himself. And he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. Their great ones exercise authority over them. That's how life works. Hammer down. Put yourself first. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You want to be somebody great in the kingdom? Serve others. Be the servant of them all. You see, Jesus basically tells us that everything we've been taught about leadership and getting authority is wrong. The kingdom is not about asserting yourself. It is about humility and meekness. When you come to know Jesus as your Savior, your hands have to be empty. You can't say, look what I'm bringing to you. Look how good I am. Look what I can do for you. Look at all this wonderful stuff I can give you. No, you've got to come to Jesus empty-handed saying, I've got nothing to offer you. All I want is Jesus. You know, you serve God the same way. We don't promote ourselves. We don't push ourselves to the front of the line. We allow God to do that. I'm convinced that when we stand before Jesus, at the Bema Seat of Christ, there will be a lot of surprised people. People that will get the best awards won't be the preachers. <gasps> won't be the people that can command thousands on a television audience or maybe 20 on a Facebook Live. Hey, everybody on Facebook Live. Those who God will reward greatly are those who are never seen in the forefront, but they serve. I expect Miss Vera is going to get a whole lot more than I ever get when we stand before God in heaven. The unsung heroes are going to be the ones that are great. Jesus said, if you are meek, you are happy because you will get to inherit the earth. It's kind of a neat phrase, you know. I, I sit there and think about this earth, it's falling apart. It's, you know, global climate change. 
Um, I'd like a little bit of global warming last week, wouldn't you? You understand that when Jesus speaks about inheriting the earth, that it will not be the earth in which we are in. This world has been tainted with sin. This world has been polluted and continues to be polluted by the hand of mankind. And this is not an ecology sermon today. I want you to know that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And if you read the book of the Revelation, at the end you realize there will come a city from heaven called the New Jerusalem. And it will come to this new earth. That's where we will live. The Jewish nation realized that. The Jewish nation realized that their inheritance was going to be a home on this earth. And I'm excited to realize that God has prepared a place for us in the new Jerusalem that will be on this earth. This world will be ours when Jesus comes again and remakes our world. When Jesus said we will inherit the earth, it won't be this earth that is full of pollution. It's going to be a gorgeous planet. I often stop and think what this planet Earth will be like when Jesus remakes it. I've seen some beauty in my life. I mean, the snow is beautiful. I know, I'm going to yell that. The forests are beautiful. I'll go so far and let you know a cornfield is beautiful. When I was in Israel back in the 70s, you know what I miss? I miss cornfields. That sounds silly. We had little bitty cornfields there in Israel. I miss cornfields because there's a beauty in a cornfield. There are beauty in the mountains. There is beauty as we look at natural wonders, say the Grand Canyon or the ocean or the beach. But it has nothing on what the new heaven and earth is going to be like. I believe that we're going to have to have glorified bodies so that our eyes will be able to enjoy everything God's going to give us. Heaven is a place, it will be on this earth, that will right all wrongs done to us. Listen, if you are meek, you will be taken advantage of and wronged. Just put it down. If you will develop a meek spirit, you will get taken for a ride. You'll be taken for advantage of. In this world, there is so much injustice where the proud and arrogant have their way and control lives of people who they crush under their thumbs. This world is ruled by the God of this world, which is a wicked ruler, Satan himself. But God is going to judge. Every wicked deed will be judged by Almighty God. False humility and pride will be exposed. And God will reward our faithfulness to him. The future kingdom will take notice of those who have humbly served the living God. There are people today that are serving God that no one takes note of. There are people today that as they serve God, they are ignored. People around our world that are doing a work for God, leading people to Christ, drawing people to the Savior that you will never hear the name of, they will be rewarded. And the most valued in the kingdom are those who get the least recognition. You see, we all want to be about recognition. We want people to look at us and go, that, that person, man, are they something else. Those who serve without recognition will be the least. They'll be the blessed. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus talks about rewards. This just astounds me as I read this. Verse 40. Matthew 10, 40, Jesus said, He receives you, receives me, and 
He who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. In other words, your reward will be equal of the preacher's. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now get this. Get this. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Think of the simplest thing you've ever been given. In the name of Christ. I still remember Porta Cabello. It was 105 degrees there that day. But that's okay because the humidity was only about 98%. <laughs> we met with a very poor church on top of a restaurant. Sides are open there. Air conditioning, well, when the wind blew, you got it. Did they? I think they had ceiling fans, if I remember right. One of the brothers came up and gave me a cup of water about like that. I was sweating out more than that uh, per minute. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, there were pools on the ground by my feet. And I've often thought of that. That the Lord Jesus, when he brings this young man to heaven is going to say, remember that time that that gringo came and preached to you guys and you gave that cup of water to him? Here's your reward. Thank you for that. You've done it for me. You think of things that are as simple as that. Just a cup of water. It's nothing. I've given water to a lot of people. Sometimes I gave with the wrong motives. But Jesus says, if you give a cup of water to a disciple, you will in no means lose your reward. Meekness will one day be rewarded and will never be overlooked. So how do I be meek? How can I develop a meekness so that I can get a, a, a reward? From, I can inherit the earth. How do I get this? Let me share with you. There's, the only way that you can be truly meek is to trust in God's plan. We're saved by meekly trusting in the Lord Jesus as our Savior. We live our lives meekly by trusting God to defend us. And what if he doesn't? What if God calls us to be taken to heaven? We'll get our reward. When we trust God, we don't have time to defend ourselves or promote ourselves. When we completely trust God, we don't have time to demand that people give us what we deserve, but rather we are simply serving Jesus. And we let God defend us and let God reward us. You think God doesn't know what's going on in your life? You think God has somehow forgotten when you meekly stepped back and let someone take the place of prominence rather than you? God has a great plan. The meek, the person who has the right attitude toward God and toward themselves realizes that they can submit to that plan. Because our goal is not to be promoted in this life. Our love of this world should become less and less. I really don't care about my best life now, okay? Just so you know it. I don't care about having the best life I can have here and making people comfortable as they go to hell. My scope is not in this world. It is the kingdom of heaven. My focus is not what you can do for me now, here and now, and how you can support me and promote me and put me first. My focus must be upon that heavenly home 
that God has called us to. We need to be like Abraham. Hebrews chapter 11, when it describes Abraham, the Bible says, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why? Okay, here's Abraham, the father of our faith. The one who tr believed God, and you've been blessed because he believed God. The one who lived his life in a tent. Okay, I like sleeping in a tent. About three days worth, and then I'm ready to get into a house. Tonight, you won't see me sleeping in a tent outside. I've done one cold winter camp out, and it's not going to happen again. Abraham lived in a tent. Why? Hebrews 11:10. For he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. The bottom line of living a meek life, of controlling myself and refusing to put myself forward is to realize there is coming a day when I will be ushered into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus will say, hey, I've been working on your place. Come here. Come here. And open the door. And you will look around and say, it's everything I ever wanted. Our future home in heaven, our future in heaven, and inheritance, is that of seeing God's glory in our life. And we'll receive that as we meekly trust in Jesus as our Savior. And the prize will be given as we meekly live our lives for him. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on eternity. You see, Jesus tells his disciples, if you want to truly be my disciple, you've got to be meek. Doesn't mean you're weak. Doesn't mean you are a limp-wristed, noodle-spined, mealy mouth. But it does mean you see God as God is in yourself, as you are. And that you deserve nothing, and you're willing to let someone's rights trump yours so that you can serve Jesus Christ. There are followers of Jesus Christ all around our world that will never receive one word of newsprint. No one will ever know their names except for the people they've ministered to. Because they've meekly served Jesus Christ. But there's coming a day when they will be ushered into the very presence of God and receive their reward. It all comes down to what you're focused on in life. What is your focus? I think all too often we play church because our focus is on this world and, and getting ahead and being the person I want to be, what the world to see me as, and getting all the rewards here and now. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. Father, build in us a meek spirit. Guide us as we some humbly serve you, as we humbly are the person you desire us to be. Father, until Jesus comes, help us serve, tell either you take us home or Jesus takes us in the clouds. Help us to meekly serve you because of our love for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For invitation, we'd like to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. I think we've got a wrong song in our, our hymnal, but it's number 376 in your hymnal. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've got some spiritual needs I need to deal with. I invite you to come as we sing that first verse.
If you have a need, you come. Let's stand as we sing this together. I've decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. That fourth verse, ask the question. Let's sing that. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Father, help us to follow Jesus. Develop in us a meek spirit. Help us to meekly share the gospel with those who need to know Jesus. And as we leave this place for our fellowship time, I pray for your blessing upon it as well. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> What's that? Does this camera need to be turned off at all? I'll turn it off quick. I'll hit it. Yeah, it does. Judy, I'm going to shut the camera off here. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs>